So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. A very welcome, well, welcome in our Bauhaus event number three. It's a great pleasure to bring to your attention great ideas that we listen around the different corners of Europe. We travel virtually all over Europe just to pick up the best ideas and raise these ideas to you with the help of Richard Kamish. Thank you very much, Richard, for guiding us in this uh, journey towards Europe uh, today. And we are very keen to listening good ideas that can change your way of doing business, can actually attract your attention and maybe reflect on upcoming developments in your market. Thank you very much, Richard, for guiding us. The floor is yours. Thank you all for being with us this afternoon. Great. Thanks very much, Luca, and good afternoon, everybody. So after the, the glamour and the excitement of the energy efficient mortgage in, uh, label launch a couple of weeks ago, we're going back to the hard work of producing some assets to actually attach those labels to. As ever, as Luca says, we've got a diverse set of ideas, presentations for you today. We have four different countries and four very different topics. As ever, please use the chat function. Please ask any questions of our speakers. Message me privately if you'd like to. And I'm going to try to submit as many of the questions as I can in the time that we, we allow ourselves. We're allowing only 30 minutes per speaker. We want to keep as rigorously to that as possible. So, like I said, we've got some, some good ideas. What are the ideas that we've got for you today? We have some thoughts on how to help banks integrate climate risks into their models. We've got some good ideas about creating an ecosystem for green mortgage lending in Spain. And we've got an update for you on the risks and opportunities coming from policies currently being deliberated in Brussels. But first of all, comment. And specifically, right, you're going to have to go and run away and read the slides that you posted on the classroom, okay, to do your work. And then you've got a lot of finishing up to do as well today, okay? You've got three lessons you've got to finish up already, okay? This is why I was trying to people to go on mute. Thank you very much for that. Sorry, it's practicalities of, of living in this online environment. Um, as I was saying, we're moving first for the first presentation to Holland and to Verde Hippotecken, which is a brand of the Junger Group. Now, in some of the previous Bauhaus events, we've heard a lot about the need to upgrade the existing being at least as important as building new green. And we've also heard a lot about the aligning of interest, making greening economically beneficial. And these are topics which Gerard Luyen and Martin Niebuhr grapple with day to day. Gerard, Martin, uh, I, I see that you're both there. Can you please talk us through what you're doing at the moment to try to make Dutch mortgages more sustainable? Yes, I think we can. Thank you very much, Richard. <clears throat> Thank you to Luca and the EMF team for inviting and supporting us in this event. Um, and uh, nice, nice to be here and to see that there is a crowd joining uh, um, to listen to, to our presentation. Uh, in this presentation, I will share our view on how the market markets in the Netherlands could have a significant impact on improving sustainability. Go to the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Before I start with uh, with the presentation itself, I'd like to give you a very short history of Google. Um, Google is an initiative of Helpitis, which is a leading IT uh, party in the Netherlands, a leading IT firm in terms of uh, developing software for originating a service in mortgages. And with Jungo, we started in 2015. And um, our aim is to create innovative and cost-efficient products leveraging on the state-of-art IT. And we have a strong drive to change for the better. With the interest of the customer in mind, um, we want to show that as a mortgage provider, you can have great and positive impact. So our first initiative was a people-to-people -people mortgage, as we used to call it, which was launched in 2018. And with this mortgage, it has been uh, uh, we have been the first mortgage provider allowing the general public, private investors, to invest directly in single individual Dutch mortgages. That means if you would have a, a mortgage which is regulated under the Dutch law, uh, in, in, in that sense, reg, uh, uh, regular mortgage originating, 
Uh, friends, families, but also other private investors could invest in your mortgage with a minimum of 250 euros, creating a cheaper mortgage for the borrower and giving the private investor a higher yield than they would have on their savings account. Uh, so that's typically something we do. And now we want to launch our the Vedder hypothetic. It's a Dutch word. Vedder in Dutch means, if you translate it into English, means further. So that's what we want to do. We want to go further, specifically in terms of uh, encouraging and facilitating the sustainability of our homes. So with this mortgage, we actually encourage and facilitate the improvement. <clears throat> and I would like to emphasize improvement of the sustainability of our homes. Why? Why should we do this? <clears throat> Sorry. Well, next slide, please. Um, we as society and as the Netherlands as a country, but as Europe as a whole also, uh, we have great ambitions in terms of improving the sustainability. There's also a need. If you look at the goals of the Dutch governments in terms of housing, um, they stated that they want to improve the sustainability for 1.5 million houses in 2030. <clears throat> that means maximum insulation, solar panels, green energy, etc. <clears throat> All houses should be gasless in 2050. And mind you, uh, in the Netherlands, around 90% of our houses is heated by gas. So that means that around 7 million houses have to invest in new alternative ways of heating their house and heating the water they use. So installation as electrical heating, heat exchanges, etc. Uh, 7 million houses in, in the next uh, uh, 30 years. Um, interesting enough, if we look at the housing stock in 2020 in terms of energy label, 77% is less than B and 58% is less than C, or C or less, I should say. So there is a lot to do. Um, and the government has to be said in terms of uh, um, uh, their ambitions, but also in terms of subsidizing, etc. they are pushing the market. And how's the market, the public, how, is, how, is, how are they reacting? Next slide, please. Uh, no, one, one back, I think. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, since a few years, consumers, being the buyers of, buyer, buyers of houses in this case, of course, positively respond uh, in terms of improving sustainability. Up until 2015, there was virtually no premium on houses which could, with a good energy level. And since then, since then it's changed a lot. In 2019, the Dutch Central Bank uh, conducted a survey that concluded that home buyers pay a significant premium to houses with a better energy level. The graph is the outcome of the survey. This is at the, the actual graph of the survey of the Dutch Central Bank. And I'll try to talk you through it. If you look at the graph, if you see the energy label D is set at zero. And all costs, etc., are uh, based on, the, on an average house for in the Netherlands. Uh, and at the average price for a house in that time, 2019, was just under 300,000 euros. The dots, the dark dots or circles you see in the graph are the premiums a buyer of a house would accept for a better label than D, or if you go to the left-hand side, the EFG, the discount they would expect for a label worse than D. The, um, the orange squares you see is the investment one has to do to go again from the label D to, let's say, B or C, or uh, the investment we have to do to go uh, from F to D. And the blue triangles are the discounted energy sa uh, uh, savings over the year. So we can conclude from this graph or this survey from the Dutch Central Bank that um, since, uh, since the last few years, the consumers, the buyers of the house, are willing to pay um, large premiums the next thing we can conclude is that the increase in value, which is the premium they are willing to pay, is in most cases covers almost the complete investment in terms of improvement of sustainability. Um, and with that, just an interesting fact, if you, if you would turn a house with an energy label G uh, that, that uses 2.9 gigajoule per square meter, and you would improve it to label A, 
you would decrease the energy consumption by 65 percent so um, if you see that uh, consumers are willing to pay an, a premium uh, and increase the value of property in terms of in, improving the sustainability you would suspect the market to also act on that so how are mortgage providers reacting to this uh, next slide please Yep, thank you. Um, if we look at the current providers in the Netherlands in terms of mortgage providers, what do they do? Well, part of them don't do anything, just do nothing. Just do what they always did, is provide mortgages, but don't do anything with the sustainable part. Um, next to that, providers may give an additional borrowing capacity based on sustainability, but it's not something they come up with, it's just something that's set in the, in the Dutch law. Um, that you can grant additional uh, uh, mortgage, additional borrowing capacity if that money supplied is used specifically for sustainability improvements. Another part of the, uh, uh, of the mortgage providers really do something, but they focus, they all have fo focus on a discount for houses with label A. So that means they focus on newly built or recently built houses, which is only a very small portion of the market. As you may remember uh, from the presentation of Mr. Piantoni of the last Bauhaus event in February, 80% of the building stock in Europe is built before 2000. And it's the same in the Netherlands. So when you focus on a level house, that means you don't provide an incentive for, let's say, improving a house from E, level E to level B. And that is where 80% uh, uh, of the stock is. So, what is the impact of improving? If, if we would improve a uh, energy label B, a B, sorry, to an energy label E, you would save on average 0.05 gigajoule again per square per month. If you would do the same from label D to label C, also one label, um, one notch better, you would save 0.4 gigajoule, that's 60% more. So the high impact is not on going from B to A, but it's ongoing from D to C, or going from E to D. So we think we should focus on improving the red and the yellow labels instead of focusing on the already green labels. Um, and therefore we introduced, uh, we, we introduced the energy label based pricing model. Um, next to that, we offer specific loan parts for, at low cost to finance improvements, and we facilitate improvements. Well, in that way, by facilitating, we help homeowners to find out what to do and how to do it and how to finance it. Um, in terms of how to do it, how to realize the improvement, we partner with a sustainability consultancy firm. Uh, in the next slide, I will share some screen, screenshots from reports they produce based on inspection of, of a home. In this case, my home, they uh, actually come to your house and they inspect it and they give you some advices. Uh, my apologies for uh, the, the, the next three slides being in Dutch, because this is actually uh, from, from the real report, but I'll talk you through it and I think you'll understand it anyway. Um, so this first slide shows what room for improvement there is. In this example, you have the solar panels on the left hand side, floor insulation and isolation glass or double glazing. Next to that, it shows the impact. In, uh, sorry, no, that, uh, not next slide. I was saying just next to that. So one slide back, please. Yes, thank you. Um, it, it shows the impact in terms of cost savings, in terms of reduction of CO2 emission, in terms of your investment you would have to do to create this improvement, the payback period, and the rate of return on your investment. So when you know what you can do, you would want to know how you can realize this. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Um, also in the report, you get, uh, uh, this is another part, uh, you get a, a summary of the impact in this case, specifically for the solution being solar panels. And next to that solution, there's also included an offering from a qualified installation partner, which can realize the solar panels. So the investment, they, they say, is not an estimation of an investment, it's based on actual offerings 
which the customer can choose. So he can uh, uh, create a solution and uh, uh, just have to, has to choose uh, the installation partner and they will realize uh, the solution for them. Um, the report also includes, because as you, as you saw just earlier, there are three solutions. Sometimes it can be the case that you can say, well, because of the house or my financial uh, abilities, I, don't, I can't or don't want to realize the three uh, uh, solutions at the same time. So how can you choose from them? Um, well, the report also includes a tool to see if the impact of the solution in, in different combinations. Next slide, please. Here you see in the left hand side on top, there are three green bars. Again, the solar panels, the insulation glass and the floor insulation. Um, they are all green, the bars, so that means that they are all selected. If we uh, would realize those three solutions, then the monthly energy cost would be reduced from 294 euros to 276 euros, as stated in the report, based on actual figures. On the right hand side, you see the impact of the solutions in an annual energy costs, reduction of CO2 emission, energy uses, and gas usage. Those are the three circles, the graphs you see. Um, you can then, if you want, this is not an interactive presentation, but uh, uh, as the, the report is digital, that is interactive. You can then toggle between the different solutions, which are in this case three, and you can say, okay, what is the impact if I would choose for, let's say, solar panels and insulation glass or insulation glass and floor insulation? So you can see uh, uh, what fits you or your house best and then make, make your choice based on that information. Um, interesting also uh, that if we should implement all three solutions, as is stated here in this example, uh, we an, uh, annually save the equivalent of 29 times flying from Amsterdam to Paris, as you can see on the bottom, or uh, eating 1,002 1, hamburgers, which I would not recommend, by the way, but that is, that is your saving if you would implement all these three. Next slide, please. So, concluding. Um, we think we should incentivize the improvement of sustainability, not only reward, reward the relatively limited number of houses with an A-label. Don't focus on what's already green, but improve those things which are red or yellow. So we encourage to use energy label based pricing and use specific loan parts for homeowners where they can finance the investment needed against low cost and favorable conditions and create a one-stop shop for the homeowners to make it easy for them to find out what to improve, how to finance it, and most importantly, how to realize the improvement. And next slide, please. Um, so again, uh, focus on improving the sustainability. Um, that created the largest impact with the 80% stock of, of uh, uh, the buildings built before 2000 with older houses usually with energy labels in the range of D to F. Um, so to do that successfully as mortgage providers, also funders could help out. Um, if buyers of houses value energy labels differently, in our opinion, also funders should do the same. Um, it's not only the right thing to do, but we also think there is a economic rationale to do so. As we've seen from the uh, report of the Dutch Central Bank, um, the higher the energy label, the higher the premium uh, uh, buyers are willing to pay. So that means higher value, and higher value means lower exposure at default. On the other hand, you have lower costs. Lower costs means lower default risk. So if you put these two together, it would sound logical to have a, an an energy label based pricing also from a funder point of view. Um, next to that, of course, also governments could support this. Um, governments already do a lot in terms of subsidizing um, uh, sustainability improvement. Um, they uh, could also create tax, uh, and sometimes they do create tax incentives, but they could also, could also create or at least push for a label based capital charge. Thus, pushing the funders to also differentiate in energy levels. 
I think that would be very interesting. So far, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, more, to more than happy to answer any questions, if there are. Thank you very much, Gerard. Um, if you do have any questions for Gerard, please pop them in the in the um, chat room chat box there. Um, I love the way that you made it very very real, very specific, very concrete, very easy to understand. Um, measuring the savings in terms of number of hamburgers, I think we should adopt as a universal standard of um, <laughs> carbon CO2 emissions. I love that. Um, I've got one question of uh, my own. Um, you mentioned about the existing mortgage lenders, and I think you mentioned also about Dutch law, focusing on levels rather than improvements. Um, yeah. They're rewarding A levels, they're not improved, they're not rewarding movements in labels. Why is that? Um, well, it's, it, it is a bit difficult in, in terms of we would have we would have to ask the other mortgage providers. But um, what we think is the market is pretty traditional, and this is this is the easy way to do so. So you could say we create like green green mortgages and green bonds, and I, I think there's there's even one provider he, who created uh, uh, an uh, RMBS or green bonds just by picking the uh, uh, a, a labeled mortgages in their portfolio. Then ring fencing them and saying, okay, so we've got we've now got green bonds. Um, so it's it's an easy way to do and it's an easy way to present yourself as being green. But in at the same time, the 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 effect it has is of course limited. And next to that, we think that um, they could also it could also be a challenge for them in terms of data management because. If you really want to imp uh, want to uh, look at and improve your uh, uh, your uh, your labels, you also want to show which of uh, uh, the the houses in my portfolio has increased actually has increased the energy label during uh, uh, that that uh, uh, the time they were in my portfolio. What did I do about it? So that would mean you you would have to have your data set. The, uh, uh, the movement in energy level. And I think that's something that uh, is probably difficult for most traditional providers to, to keep in their data sets. And, and understood. I, I think the idea of um, you know, a lot of work's been done on the correlation between the risk of a mortgage, default probability and whatever, and the, and the energy level. It'd be yeah. interesting to know if that's actually about the level or about the change in level that really drives that. That'd be an interesting area yeah. for um, for the support. We've got got a couple of questions that have come up um, from from the audience. Um, first one about the what should the price difference be between different energy levels in order to incentivize? Do you have a hard number on that? One? <clears throat> um, not well, not, not a really hard number because it's always uh, uh, um, the consumer is sometimes difficult to predict, but if you look at the Netherlands, and I, I would I would imagine that it's the same in most countries. Of course, um, mortgages are very much price driven. At the same time, if we look now, uh, we see, uh, especially in the generation, let's say uh, people from 25 to 40 years, uh, they tend to uh, uh, say, "I'd rather have solar panels than the new kitchen." Uh, uh, so um, it's it is shifting. But if you really look at it from uh, a price point of view, our, our view is that if you would have in total 30 base points, so 0.3% between F and A, that should be enough. That, that should be enough to give uh, every every jump from uh, F to the G, uh, et cetera, let's say around five base points, that should be that should be more than enough to encourage people to, to really move uh, across the line. It's fascinating being able to quantify that. I immediately want to look at the default probabilities and, and work out the capital break-even point for, um, you know, to, to align the incentives with the, the risk, risk reward and the, the, the bank capital models. Um, we've had one other question um, uh, from Sanjay Joshi um, about the tax incentives that are currently available for lenders, develop, developers, and home buyers. Um, can you? Briefly run through what what incentives are currently there from a fiscal point of view. Um, I'm afraid I can't briefly. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried you were going to say that. Yeah. Um, well, what what we do off in the Netherlands, we have uh, um, uh, 
uh, on houses, they, we don't have any tax incentive on houses. We do have tax incentives on green cars, uh, like energy-driven cars, um, uh, or electric cars. Um, what the, the Dutch government does in housing, they subsidize some, uh, some specific uh, uh, improvements. So in general, it is if, we, if I would improve, uh, or no, if I would invest in, let's say, double glazing and uh, um, solar panels, I would always have to do at least two things. So if I only do double glazing, I then don't get any subsidies. Uh, um, the subsidize, if, it, if I implement two solutions, so let's say double glazing and solar panels, then uh, the Dutch government would uh, grant me 30% uh, sub sub they would subsidize my investment by 30%. That is what they do. And next to that, and that is why it's pretty diff difficult, there's also every city or every community may have its own set of rules and set of subsidies or even uh, tax incentives, but that, that may differ per, uh, per city or per uh, municipal. So I hope that is part of the answer, or, or maybe a complete answer. I know that that is an, 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 an yeah an impossibly complicated area, and it's it's um yeah impossible to do in five minutes. But th thank you, that that is very helpful. Do, do we have any other questions from anybody in the audience for uh, for Gerard? Okay, in that case, I'm sure if you do have any questions subsequently, uh, ah, perfect. Here's Gerard's contact details. Please, please um, feel free to get get back to him, um, well, and then we can. Thanks again, okay. once again, Gerard. Yeah. Thank and you very much. Move on to our second. Okay. Our second presentation of the day. And uh, good luck with the other yeah. presentation. Uh, thank you, thank Richard. You. Can I make a, co a comment, Richard? <clears throat> I mean, it was um, very very nice to see the confirmation of uh, what is the average cost for moving our uh for moving an apartment uh, up to a better energy performance i mean i see now it's almost uh, seven years that we discuss with people and there is a uh, this twenty thousand k is happening and popping up everywhere so i mean um i think that we have to reflect and also how to make this message very simple for consumer i think that in average i mean we have to think about the 20k expenses for consumers to cut down one third of their running cost of the house so this is i think i mean i think it's very important because sometimes they are asking us what is the average cost i mean this was a nice confirmation also from knauf we have been discussing with knauf in average to move two categories up so reducing one third of the housing cost it is twenty thousand. so this is i think numbers that are popping up in brussels and now they are all fake numbers, but I see confirmation in a lot of presentations. So thank you very much, Gerald, because I mean, today is a, it's a very easy. We have to have a simple message. It's 20,000 to reduce one third of your housing costs. That's, that's more or less, I see this popping up in several presentations. Um, thank you. It was just a comment because it was a nice confirmation. Thank you, Richard. No, I, I, I totally agree. I think real numbers are so helpful, especially when you're trying to explain this to people and actually persuade people. Um, we could talk about policies and abstract ideas as much as we like, but when we actually see hard cash, um, that makes it real. Um, if we can we move on to our second presentation today. So one of EMF ECBC's main partners in Spain in the El whole Energy Efficient Mortgage Initiative is Union de Creditos Immobiliaris. And I apologize for the pronunciation now, but I'd like to turn to, to them now. UCI, as a company, touches on, on many aspects of the mortgage value chain, and it helps people in various roles with the education, awareness, simplification, coordination to make the green journey easier. Uh, I'd like to ask Katia Alves, UCI's Head of Sustainability and Corporate Responsibility, to talk us through Katia, how UCI attempts to build, as, as I think you put it, a robust ecosystem. Katia, can I okay. hand over to you? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm going to share my screen with you. Please confirm me that you see my screen. Yes. So I would like, thank you very much. For me, it's a pleasure to share with you how uh, are we raising awareness in making properties greener. Uh, from uh, UCI. Uh, so in 2018, uh, UCI joined the DMAP initiative 
and inside we launch as well our green strategy. We use the Simon Sinek Golden Circle. We started with the why and then we went to the how and what. With the why because we believe in sustainability and we believe that buying a house uh, it's one of the main uh, responsibilities for uh, each family to do so. And by creating, uh, and how do we want to do it? Uh, creating ecosystems that complement each other. And we want to, to offer uh, sustainable and efficient products and services for our clients, for the families. So uh, by doing so, we, 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 we made a call, we launched the green mode uh, to ask others to join us in this green revolution. So, do you, here, sorry. Hace mucho que todos firmamos la hipoteca más grande del mundo. La hipoteca de nuestro verdadero hogar. Porque nuestro hogar es mucho más grande que una casa. Es mucho más que cuatro paredes. Es, en definitiva, allí donde vivimos. Y estamos hipotecados con él. Durante miles de años solo hemos liquidado intereses y nos hemos comportado como inquilinos despreocupados de su futuro y de su bienestar. Ahora ha llegado el momento de amortizar capital de sentirnos propietarios y actuar en consecuencia. De cuidar, de proteger y de garantizar la sostenibilidad del hogar, de nuestra casa. Esa es la única forma de hacer que nuestra hipoteca con él sea una hipoteca. La hipoteca de un futuro al que nos podemos adelantar. Sí. Muy pronto no gozarán por obligación. Podemos hacer que nuestro beneficio repercuta a todos. Que las casas que financiamos protejan el medio ambiente y mejoren la calidad de vida de sus propietarios. Podemos hacer que vivir mejor nos cueste menos. Podemos actuar en modo green. Te apuntas? The videos will be will be released afterwards for you to see it properly because I believe the internet flow is a it stays a little bit uh, hard hard to see the, the the video correctly. This video speaks about the biggest mortgage in the world, uh, the one that is our true home, where we live, planet Earth and that we are in debt with it. So far, we have only paid interests, interests, and we have been behaved like carefree tenants. Right now, it's time to pay back, uh, to behave correctly. It's time to make the change. It's time to take care and to protect, to feel true owners. And above all, we, we can make the difference and we can contribute to overtake a sustainable future where we can take the lead to change. Because now something that it is for pleasure to, to take the lead on the sustainable, uh, the sustainable uh, housing tomorrow will be mandatory. So we can make, we make a call for our customers, for our partners, to make their properties greener. This is the, the, the essence, the soul of this video. So continuing, we have, made, we have built our 360 strategy in the green strategy uh, by developing our business in five lines. By commitment, with positioning, with our business model, with our collaboration and methodology. 
And of course, we had to improve processes and database in order to, to know data and to know the correlation analysis that we have to, to figure and to analyze, to analyze. So nothing new that I'm speaking about now, but you know uh, that during this journey, we have been experiencing some stoppers, some criticalities, lack of awareness among consumers and other partners about the green, uh, poten uh, potential complexity of journey, energy advice, uh, and additional process costs, initial and after renovation uh, works EPC, valuation and energy certification, and uh, lack of coordination and between and relevant partners, government, institutions, uh, utilities, energy advisors. It's a very complex process. So the challenge is to change these stoppers into opportunities. The challenge, the challenge is to pursue people. So uh, to tackle our main problem, we have decided to develop the greenization strategy. And, uh, and by doing so, we want to put knowledge in all the value chain. We have, we, with this greenization strategy, we want to foster sustainability into our stakeholders' business model. We want to create awareness in all value chain and from there to create a robust ecosystem. This we have launched the last, last year in November, the Green Motionate, where is a meeting point that we wanted to promote sustainability and energy efficiency in housing among real estate professionals. We have counted with more than 21 speakers and with 140 assistants. dejando a nuestros niños qué mundo les vamos a dar decididamente el sector inmobiliario tiene que contribuir con esa reducción de consumo la vida es cambio cambio continuamente cambio tipping point el año del cambio y la sostenibilidad se va a desarrollar en todos los ámbitos felicitaros a todos por la decisión que habéis tomado de sumaros a este cambio por liderar el cambio a green en los hogares que estáis ayudando a formar This video, this meeting point, uh, speaks also about that the future will be greener or won't be future at all. In this meeting point, we have accomplished to create an integrated network. We have been capable of, the, the call was to valuation companies, constructors, developers, renovation companies, uh, renewables companies, we have changed experiences and best practices. And with this, we want to foster skills and best, practice, best practices that we want all of the value chain to believe, believe that the green is good, that the sustainability in the house, in the real estate market, it's very important. And change, change and change. We have to take the lead. We want our partnerships, our partners to take the lead in improving real estate properties, make them greener. We have also, besides the green motionate, we have also developed green materials in order to help our partners to sell the green as well. Because sometimes when we get to the client, we are at the end of the process. So before the bank, the, the financial entity, 
contacts with the client, we have to make available materials for them to real estate agents, for refurbishment companies and other to go directly to the client and to sell the green and to make them to believe that they can make their house greener, the house will value more and will be, will be less uh, energy costs and as well, they will have well-being, will be uh, living better inside their houses. So we have developed the energy saving calculator. This energy saving calculator shows our clients that that may, by making some renovation works, they can save costs, uh, energy costs, and they, what kind of refurbishment they have to perform in order to save that energy costs. We have also launched the green refurbishment notebook in, in, in order to help our renovation, company, renovation companies to sell the, the energy efficiency uh, renovation works to, uh, to their clients as well and go and, and put the, the, the energy efficiency parameter inside the refurbishment works besides the statical works and the, the guideline books, the energy efficiency guideline, guideline books that we have developed as well in order to sell all of this green, uh, this green, uh, this green uh, works that uh, people can make to, in order to, to develop uh, what there has to be done inside the house. And we have launched uh, videos in order to train uh, all of the, the stakeholders that we are within in order to them to know what we, when we speak about rehabilitation, what are we talking about? Renovation or geothermy or, or solar panels or solar energy. So in order to train all of the, all of the value chain. We have launched as well uh, key partnerships, uh, key strategic, strategic partnerships with the IAB, EMF, uh, with Spain Energy Rehabilitation Long-Term Strategy, with the Green Building Council Spain, with Global Appraisal and Energy Efficiency Experts, with Qualify Renewables Energy Utilities, with United Nations Global Impact, with Lisboa Capital Europea uh, 2020, quali uh, Qualify Refurbishment Companies and others. The trigger here is to create partnerships is to for them to get in in this whole complex process and to be part of it as well with with ourselves so these are the wind of changes we want to be transformation agents from ECI we want to promote the change and we want to help uh, you to transform your business model towards green we want you to believe in green, in the energy efficiency and sustainability, as much as we do. Uh, so we 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 think that by foster, by by tackle the problem and put all knowledge in all the value chain is a plus for ourselves, for all the stakeholders, and for society. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Katia. And um, let's sure. love the presentation, love those those very slick presentations. Um, you don't have to un understand Spanish to get the uh, get the message from those. Um, now you mentioned there about real estate professionals, and from I've got to say, from my own personal experience, the person selling me a house or the person selling my house for me is not very aligned with this. They're perhaps the value chain, from my experience, they 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 don't care. They don't sell on those kind of grounds. So I guess I've got two questions. What do you think is holding them back in terms of why, why aren't they having those conversations currently? And at that training event in your second video, um, what were you telling them? How are you helping them to overcome, start those conversations? The, the first question you made, the, the first question that uh, it's true uh, at this time, not all the real estate agents are selling the art they are not putting the the green parameter in the in the in the selling uh, the house in the equation nevertheless it's like uh, it's like a process no so our 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 role here is to is to foster uh, this this need to to help them also to to see uh, the need of selling the green to, to sell the, the the sustainable the need of the of the of the green greener house 
um, they don't believe. I believe the trigger is that at this time they don't believe. So it's a process. And with all that we are doing so far, we want them to believe. And by doing so, I think the, the time will give us reason because will come to us because at this time they'll see that the has said in the in the previous presentation the 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 running costs of a house, uh, the, the well-being of a house, the energy savings that you can have, and also the price of the house, the valuation of the house. If all of these parameters in the equation go up, the real estate agents will will get on board and will will help us to sell greener houses to foster this part of the market. So it's a process. There are the early adopters, and then there are the, the the adopters that will come later. So at this time, we are starting. We have launched the Grimotionate. It's the the first the first event that has been in Spain to, in order to green, green, uh, green, greenizing the real estate agents, this, 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 uh, this group of, of people, that in order for them to see how can they do it. This is what I see. The second point, the second question you made is how can we help them? We can help them to give some, to give them tools for them to sell the green, the running costs of the house, the saving costs, the, the kind of work that has to be done, may have, may have to be done in the house. Because if you speak at this time, at this real time, if you speak to a client or even to a real estate agent uh, of uh, improving uh, the energy efficiency, efficiency of the house, they will start thinking that maybe we are talking about very large costs and sometimes it's not like that if you have some kind of work in isolation or renewables or 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 um air conditioning air conditioning or eating maybe you can decrease one third percent when one third of the running costs and you get a greener house and you will will and will be greener the house so you have to give these kind of tools and arguments to the real estate agents in order to them them to put in value all of that what have to be done and have to be said to the, the final client. You're in mute, Richard. You're in mute. <laughs> kind of learned that after a year of lockdown. Um, yep. Um, no. What, what, on the calculator that you mentioned on one of your slides, is, is that targeted at consumers or is that targeted at the real estate professionals to help them? I mean, you mentioned both. the calculator. You have it. It's both. It's it's a, okay. it's a, an open tool. You can you can do it yourself, like a, cl a final client, or even you can use it as a real estate agent in order to to B two B two C approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the trigger yeah, here is to the trigger from our point of view, it's to get all of the value chain persuade to sell the green. And even when I'm go when I go to a refurb a renovation company uh, to ask for to to a renovation works in my house, they have to get they have to have the the green parameter in in their selling. They have to know that even if they 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 give their opinion about the the color of the walls or the the kind of, of of bathrooms or kitchen that that I should do. They have to get the the parameters, the the energy efficiency, renovation, uh, works that must be uh, should be done. Right. Um, another question, which um, which actually which has come up in, in the messages, is which, which other stakeholders does this also include valuers? Yes, of course, of so course, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And, and yes. What, what, what's that conversation? How, how is that? Is that actually hard coded into the valuation methodology, or is it simply an education education process? Well, it's well, at at this very uh, at this very moment in Spain uh, and in Portugal uh, Portugal as well, we we are facing both. It's a kind of training as well. It's a they 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 come on board with us, come along with us, 
Um, but uh, we, we are starting to see as well that they are starting to make analytics in their own works. Even if they go to make a house valuation, even if the client doesn't demand for an EPC or for a, an energy certifier or whatever, they are starting to recollect data in order for them to develop inside uh, tools to see the correlation between the, the EPC or the, and, the, and the valuation of the house. They are starting to develop in their own database um, um, cases like this and algorithms to, to see if there is any kind of correlation or not and, uh, and, they, are, and they believe that it exists. Uh, a correlation between the valuation of the house and the energy efficiency performance of the house as well. Right. And, and, and a very basic question. This all sounds good. I want my real estate professionals to know this. I want my valuers to start thinking about these things, but you know, it's not cost free. Running training courses costs money. What, what's the economics? Are you, how do, how economics. do you? Uh, economics it's a, it's a training so they have to to pay to get on board or of course to to to, to assist the, the the event and for the and for the partners that we that that are and for the the real estate agents that work with us uh, it's like a trade off between the the UCI points that we have and the the cost of the of the of the training it means that if they, they if they sell the green, if we finance the green, so they can trade off like uh, Iberia or like uh, how, uh, One World, or it's like a trade off. I they, they give me point, I give them points, and they can trade make a trade off. Understood. Great. That's uh, thank you for that. Do we have any other questions from the audience for, for Katia? Okay, in that case, Richard, Katia, thank you. Can, so I, can, I, can sorry. I say a few things? Uh, sorry, Richard. I think the, I would like to thank, first of all, for the passion on, by which Katia has presented what they are doing. I think they are really a pioneer in the sense that they are implying, they are implementing a 360 degrees strategy from the real estate uh, agencies till the EIB to port in UTI. I mean, we, we see this kind of a very comprehensive approach to green, which is uh, the, uh, I think the sign of um, a very strategic approach towards sustainability, which is quite important, that's what we see. But also what Katia is doing is uh, bringing a green factor in the pocket of consumer. I think that's the strategy that, and that's, I think, the real engine that can make the revolution happen. Um, what we have seen today with Gerard and Martin, it was a clear, simple price that consumer can easily understand. And then Katia now is developing a kind of network to bring this kind of green factor visible for consumer. That's, I think, how the revolution will happen. And I would like just to express our gratitude to Katia, Roberto, for what they are doing in such a, uh, I would say, a comprehensive picture. They are changing the entire business line towards sustainability and innovation, because what we are bringing is really uh, a new ideas and new innovation in the method of how you approach the, mar the market. So thank you very much for this. Sorry, Richard. Uh, no, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, Anna, Anna Bruno, are you online? You, you had a comment to make, I think. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, say that we uh, just uh, received a confirmation for a European project dealing with uh, the idea of uh, a, the the recognition of competencies at European level for all the people involved in the refurbishment of, uh, of buildings. Because we believe uh, that uh, it's not, uh, not only uh, necessary to have uh, good materials, good design and good behavior of uh, citizen, but above all uh, we need uh, um, qualified people that is going to introduce uh, any new technology, uh, both for refurbishment or for uh, uh, solar power or also for the digitalization, uh, which is uh, the, the future anyway of the building, um, the building construction. So um, 
our project for seed involvement of both uh, the on the demand side and offer side because we also believe that not all the people is really uh, aware of the importance of uh, having uh, some plants uh, with the uh, really certified uh, high tightness or good uh, installation of uh, solar power photovoltaic. So we would like uh, to, to share the, the project will uh, is just started, so uh, I hope that you will uh, would agree to receive some information about this project. Uh, the idea is that we have some kind of uh, building passports that could be used uh, all over Europe so that everyone can look for qualified people and every worker or professional can be certified uh, with uh, the recognition of these competencies. I think that will be something very interesting perhaps to hear about more about in, in a future uh, Bauhaus event. And so, sorry, Anna, that is Horizon 2020 funding that you've got there, is that? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Was so it one of the last of uh, the building, uh, buildings, uh, this built up initiative from EASME. Right, okay. Sounds like a very good topic for a, for a future Bauhaus event. Thank, thank you for that, Anna, and congratulations on that. And Katya, thank you again for thank you. I your just, presentation. Thank you. Richard, I, I just wanted to uh, thank you. Uh, and and I just wanted to add one, one sentence that I use a lot. Don't forget that customers and clients, final clients, may not demand the green at this moment, but they don't reject the green. So the trigger here, here is to offer the green. If it's the renovation company, if it's the real estate agent, if it's the bank, if it's the valuators, it's to offer because the people are not closed to these to these idea. They don't demand, but they don't reject. So it has to be work. Has to as work has to be done in that in that in that in that in that in that, in that way that we have to offer. And for that, we have to, to, to train and all the value chain must be orientated at the, the green, at the at sustainability, at energy efficiency. Thank you very much. Thank you. Understood. That's a, a good point, Katia. Good point to end on. Thank you. Um, we're now going to change tack completely away from the consumer aspects or, the, or the, that, those parts of the value chain. I move to the world of policy, never far from our thoughts, particularly for, for Luca in Brussels. And I think we'd like to take a look at some of the key decisions that the European Union is going to be making in the near future, which are relevant to what all of us are trying to do here. Now, at the very first Bauhaus event before Christmas, we started the discussion about the taxonomy newly published at that time. Sean Kidney spoke to me about the taxonomy and, and some possible problems with it, but I'm sure you remember. Um, but the taxonomy is just one of the challenges, and I guess challenges really ought to be opportunities in, in, in this case, but a very vital one. Now, if I can, I'd like to turn to Sigurd Neschmidt of Copenhagen Economics, um, who's going to talk us through the way he sees some of the opportunities and challenges which are coming up at the moment from Brussels. Sigurd, are you, are you online? Yes, I am. Can you hear Great. me? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. So the headline here, the financing the transition to a carbon neutral economy, very broad title. Then I have some two selected opportunities and two uh, specific challenges I'd like to talk you through. So if you can have the first slide. Uh, opportunity number one uh, is, I think, the well-known one that um the uh, renovating the housing stock has a massive potential to reduce the climate footprint at low cost that is recognized by by the commission in some of its recent proposals uh that by increasing the rate with which you go through the old housing stock you can save a huge amount of carbon footprint at the eu level that that's an old story I guess it's also somewhat a low, an old story that when you look at the costs of taking carbon out of the European economy, any renovation projects come really at the low end. 
I won't I'll nail myself to the to the ship by by professing belief in the specific numbers, but if you look at the right hand slide of uh, of here, it's called the marginal abatement cost curve. What that really is about what does it cost at the margin to reduce carbon by a number of different investment uh, investment opportunities. And if you look at the left hand side, you have clearly in innovation as uh, investment opportunities that can sometimes even reduce um, uh, the carbon emission at negative cost, at least much lower cost than it takes to um, build, for example, renewable energy. And that's an option there's a lot of scope for in the EU. So here, clearly, a, a no-brain opportunity. The second opportunity, if you take the next slide, is that if there ever was a good time to push forward, that is now. As you all know, after the uh, COVID-induced recession, also a number of the economic problems prevailing in, in a number of EU countries prior to the COVID crisis, we have a lot of spare capacity. You have just taken from uh, a recent OCD publication on the, if you look here at the left-hand side, you have production way below potential. So what this is showing is that even in two years time, the production level in the EU will be well below potential. So there is a lot of idle resources out there that could be put to work by doing these renovations. And that's also what you see in the second slide here. Unemployment rates are high and rising, in particular in some of the countries that have been hard hit by the COVID crisis. I think the third one is that when you want to, if you want to get the economy going again, um, it's a classical uh, tool for governments to spend more on investments and to increase public consumption to get the economy going again. But as you also know, a lot of EU governments are struggling to make, to make ends meet with huge deficits um, and rising debt burdens. So what I'm saying here in this second opportunity is that you have a need to provide boost to the economy. You have governments in need of providing those boosts, but having no money. And what do we have? We have a massive opportunity to do innovations with low cost, in fact, very often with zero cost for governments. So again, a perfect opportunity to push forward with this. Then challenge number one is the taxonomy proposal. Uh, this came out uh, end of last year, and there's always been a lot of um, feedback on those criteria, those the proposal being too stringent. And I basically two here two slides on this. The first one slow shows that uh, the what is the overall distribution of labeling across a number of EU countries. What you'll see here is that for most of these countries, the, the average label on existing building stock is way below A, which is the proposed uh, uh, threshold level for the taxonomy, EPCA. Um, that goes in fact very much in, in line with the Dutch presentation that um, the huge potential is maybe not taken from B to A, it is simply lifting uh, the building blocks from, from much lower levels to something short of A. And I think that is something that's also shown at the right-hand slide here. This is a specific uh, project that's been undertaken in Denmark where the Danish association that is organizing social housing has asked a Danish institute to look at what could be a meaningful way of renovating the housing stock, the social housing stock. So if you look at these solid blue lines, it is where is the current uh, stock being labeled currently? And then the light blue would show where will they be with labels after meaningful renovation has taken place. So a lot of movement to the left, which is fantastic because that is um, something driving um, lower housing bills for the tenants. It will very often also provide a better quality of housing because you don't only do climate investments, you also do basic renovation of these buildings. And yet, very few of these buildings will actually move into the A. So you have here a taxonomy 
that you have here a taxonomy that may in fact prevent or rather not allow housing financing to go to these investments and not being allowed to be categorized as green by the new taxonomy. And I also here like to uh, emphasize the point made by the Dutch presentation that very often uh, going to for new buildings to uh, zero emissions or close to zero emissions or even above zero emissions is simply not cost effective. So when you go from let's say D to E or from C to B, you can actually achieve both a lower total cost for the tenant and an improved climate energy. When you go from B to A or higher, you will sometimes maybe have an impact on the climate, so lower emissions, but tenant costs will go up. So it's not cost effective. So I think the basic message here is that the taxonomy proposal may block private finance flowing to renovation because the thresholds are too high. And more than that, the ambitions in these thresholds are in fact where you are losing a lot of opportunities for investments where the tenant is better off and the climate is better off. So think about the total sustainability of these, both the economic one for the tenants and the environmental one for the climate. So that is challenge number one, that the, the taxonomy may in being highly, highly ambitious, in fact, block the financing flowing to these investments. Challenge number two, is the another related issue here and also something that is important for a lot of the people in this audience is the implementation of the Basel IV. Now the implementation of Basel IV is very much about um, controlling risks and uh, particular risks that are associated with what's called internal rating models, uh, where banks and financial institutions are trying to assess what are really the risks associated with their portfolio. Now, what the proposal is here to make a so-called output law, what does that mean? It means that you are imposing a minimum amount of, of capital that needs to be served for a given investment. Now, what is the problem then from a climate policy perspective? Here we try to make a small example here. So look at here at the left hand side, you have two buildings with different labels that has different uh, risk rates. And then with a if we have a model whereby you use the our estimation of what the risk rate should be based on the higher collateral value created by the innovation, this new building will in fact have a lower risk rating. It goes back also to elements of what's talked about in the Dutch uh, presentation. When you do innovation, you increase the value of the house, hence also you increase the collateral and all other things equal, that you reduce the risk weight. But final slide here, if you can take the next animation. If you have an output flow, what does that mean? It means that these two houses need to assign the same capital, even though the one is more risky than the other one. So here you in fact decentivize the um, for the bank from a prudential regulation perspective, you decentivize during the duration. So here we have, I think, two self-imposed challenges uh, that might risk um, blocking finance flowing to um, innovative innovation. Uh, these are important issues because both for the uh, Basel IV proposal, the commission is coming out with recommendations probably in the second quarter and the autonomy proposal and consultation has been just finished and the commission also needs to make assessments on what they want to take forward. But here we, have, we think we have two challenges where the huge benefits to provided by the economy and to the climate may be blocked. So that leads me to the final slide, which is about my conclusions recommendations here. So the first one is, if you can take the first one, next slide, please. Yeah, so that is the Green Deal. Um, we have set aside in the Green Deal around 750 billion to support the uh, climate, to support digitalization, and support the economic recovery over the next three years. For us, for, I think for the EU, this is a golden opportunity 
for mobilizing private finance with in, in a situation where you have a lot of strained public finances and there's a lot of low-hanging fruits. The low-hanging fruit is that you have many, many investment products in Europe that can be done with zero public financing, simply picking up the opportunities to invest. Now, what does that give in terms of recommendations? I think you need to take a broad approach. Of course, the taxonomy and the Basel package, they should be implemented in a way that support and not impede private finance flowing to our uh, innovation. Then I would also say digitalization, which is one of the prime objectives of the uh, Green Deal is also very important here. I think that's also been touched upon in some of the previous speakers because digitalization allows you to identify at much lower costs um, the opportunities for where to invest. It allows you to record exposed what how much more efficient buildings are after and reporting it to investors. So digitalization really is a means to reduce transaction costs and improve verification of what you have done. Um, and thirdly, I would say um, the European semester. As you know, the 750 billion package is not coming without strings attached. There are conditionalities imposed, which I think is a good thing because it will allow the EU as a whole to see that the plans governments in Europe are putting forward to gain access to these funds are well structured. And I think this is also a golden opportunity to see that member states are putting in place policy at the national level that can be helpful in this perspective. And that can be issues like the rent regulation. We know that a number of countries, rent regulation is uh, blocking um, private finance because uh, the owners cannot increase rents when they have more capital investments, um, blocking uh, situations that are good both for the owners of the buildings and the tenants. There are also issues around the legal system for closer rules and so on and so forth that makes it more costly to finance innovation. So I think that's also an opportunity. And then I think they might take away from this is who are the winners with a smart approach is, of course, the climate. Uh, it's the quality of housing, because when you do the renovation, you're not only providing a lower energy bill, you typically also improve the quality of the building. It's, of course, the economy, because you are speeding up uh, investments and jobs. It's public finances, because not only is this less costly than other things, but if you could get the economy going in a situation where there's a lot of spare capacity, you increase tax revenues, you reduce public expenditures. And then I would say a specific focus group is lower uh, income families. Lower income families are those who are most exposed to unemployment during the crisis, but lower income families are also those who may benefit the most from smart focus financing to do innovation because they are the ones who maybe are less um, capable of finding their own out of their own pockets, and also those who are maybe needing most help in identifying it. So I think if we do this, this thing smart, there are so many uh, winners coming out, um, and I think the policies to deliver on that are well known. It's all about implementation, from my perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sigurd. Um, there's so many points there that I want to comment on or, or ask about. I'm not sure where to start, really, but um, I'm going to start with, with, with the point about the output floor, if I can. Um, now, I, I, I understand this complaint, and I know that a lot of people in banking have been saying that if you limit an output floor, you're limiting the ability to take risks, but you're also limiting the correlation between riskiness and um, bank lending and in, in a way you're incentivizing more risky lending by giving everyone a, a common common measure of that risk. Um, is the answer in changing the risk floor, the output floor to take into account risk sensitivity, uh, to take into account energy levels, that there's a different floor for this category or that category of, of, of energy? I think what we, we, as you know, we are doing a, a study on specifically on this. So um, I think the, the basic point we are making is that uh, you should certainly allow 
the institution that is providing the finance to record uh, a, the building being renovated as having higher collateral value. And with a higher capital collateral value, all other things equal, it also has a less riskiness. And that lower riskiness should allow itself to reduce the capital it put aside for prudential regulation. Then there are some further issues around how to um, um, compare uh, different uh, assets in stress testing. I think that's that's a, a different issue we can come back to later. But simply, the basic fact is, if you if you want to incentivize um, investments and, and recognizing that um, the collateral values is is in reality high, and then having something put in place that disallow the institution from um, recognizing this lower risk will simply make it less attractive for banks to provide financing on the margin. Mm. Yeah, well, understood. Um, and then I think also your point, your point about the taxonomy. Um, I and mean, as I said, we spoke to Sean Kidney in the first of these Bauhaus events about um, this and about having too exclusive a definition, an A category. I think there's a saying that perfect is the enemy of good. Um, uh, why do you think that is? Do you think it's because the taxonomy is trying to be used for many different things, many different reasons? It's about building regulations, it's about quant it's about valuations, it's about finance. It's too general a tool just to say A is the right taxonomy and everything else is bad. Yeah. Or do you think it's more, I, more I think, you, I think ultimately, ultimately any binary threshold is arbitrary. Um, yeah. And I think long term, I would like to move to something that is more risk based. But when you make a binary classification, like in the taxonomy, you need you need at least to set it at a meaningful level. And 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 the meaningful level cannot be such a such a high level that few will actually comply. And I think the Dutch presentation and also some of the things we have been doing is if it's really true was also the way I read the Dutch presentation that the marginal benefit from moving from B to A is much lower than moving in the other ones. You in fact may be incentivizing the least interesting part of the transition you can possibly think of. I mean, that for me is, is bizarre. And I think when you look at the, the example we had from, uh, which is a very interesting study done on, on Danish data where really a thorough investigation of the best possible way of renovating 500,000 Danish buildings that very few will benefit. Just for me, it makes it clear that this is not the path to take um, to force uh, institutions to renovate to a level that is barely economically viable instead of allowing um, the most beneficial renovations to take place. For me, that is simply not a meaningful approach to take. Uh, and there has been a lot of input from a number of different stakeholders across Europe to allow a more, um, to, to allow thresholds that at least will allow much more investment to flow, to provide this financing uh, and allow it to be counted as a green asset. I think, to be honest, it's a no brainer, definitely a no brainer to change that threshold. It, um, it it feels like it, and everything that I've heard about it feels like a no-brainer. But are you optimistic? Do you think that message is getting across? Um, I, I hope an opportunity such as today spreading the message and making sure that numbers such as provided by the dot presentation, by our presentation, and the whole idea about the Green Deal, about trying to mobilize private finance, it for me is you know, getting the message across to those who are making decisions. Um, the numbers should here be the ones who are counting. And I think the numbers that we are showing us on should be the proof that this cannot be the way forward. Right. Um, I've had one, one uh, request being messaged uh, here, um, asking if you could go through the, the first slide, uh, cost CO2 savings trade-off in a bit more detail. Um, you touched on that very briefly, and I think it would be helpful just to understand. Yep. If we can yep. move to that first slide again, please. Yes, um, please. You spoke about a trade-off in terms of cost on your y-axis, 
and, and savings, I think, on yes. your x-axis. Can you go back to that slide? I think that was the second slide. Second it? slide, please, yeah. yeah. Perfect, so think, yes, this one. I think yeah, if if uh, I had the dot, I would really like to have the dot presentation uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an additional one, because I think it has two dimensions. Now, dimension number one is that you, you of course, when you want to decarbonize economy, it's I think it's a no-brainer as well. You want to start with the cheapest, cheapest, versions why would you want to start with that because that is ultimately you want to impose the lowest possible cost on consumers wage earners and so on and so forth to do the carbonization so this is what a, a mitigation cost curve mean on the left hand side you start with where you have low costs in fact you can even have negative costs and that would be probably in in the eu uh, buildings with a very low energy labeling, very old buildings uh, for many, many different reasons. Uh, it can be regulation, it can be um, simply lack of appraisal opportunities that by investing in these, the, the cost to the tenants will be negative. What does that mean? It means that when you're investing X millions in a particular house, you would reduce carbon footprint, but you would at the same time reduce the total tenant costs. That means it has negative abatement cost. So on the right hand side, you have uh, on the very right hand side, you have mitigation options where yes, uh, cost goes uh, the 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 uh, carbon emissions goes down, but the ones using those kind of services will have to pay a higher bill. That's basically what I, uh, this kind of abatement cost shows that you move from something that have, might have a negative cost to something that has a positive cost. And here in all the studies shown at global level shows there's a lot of potential to go through the existing housing stock and do savings of energy and hence also CO2 yet providing a lower bill for consumers. That should be the no-brainers. It's, of course, takes a lot of time and so on and so forth, but it's doable. Now, I wouldn't like to have a second slide. It is that shows that when you go, no, not this one, but <laughs> but the one the, the, the dot show, because that was a very nice chart that showed how is the energy bills, how is the energy savings going from level A, B, C, and when you go upwards and what is the so and what is the energy savings and what are the cost and what that slide showed was that when you go from let's say b to a the the energy savings that you have are cost is starting to become marginal while the cost may even increase so going from b to a in many instances will will may may reduce emissions somewhat but the tenant cost, owner's cost will go up. So that is, if you like, when you look at the opportunities to invest in any in renovation, really focusing on the most promising options, which are not going from B to A, but going upwards below those scales. Those are very, very important messages to have, and in particular when you're thinking about the taxonomy. Understood. Thank you. So um, I, I guess there's another axis, if you like. So there's that, that axis you have on here of zero is the no-brainer axis. Yes. Presumably above that, there is a a cost of carbon emissions, yeah. so whether that's a, on a tax basis yeah. or just a calculation. Yeah. Of but but the, the, yeah, but the interesting point there, and that's something maybe we can come back to in a later stage, most EU countries actually already today tax energy use for heating. So there are also today a lot of opportunities to invest where it will save tenants costs because they will save energy taxes. So that applies to a large part of Northern Western European countries where um, uh, there's a lot of tax on energy that goes into heating. And then you have a number of European countries where taxation is lower. So even when you go about the zero one, the social costs are there, 
but for tenants, there might even be a benefit because they save taxes. So you, you can go up on this curve above zero and there will still be savings for tenants in many, many cases. Right, and I suppose this whole model is predicated, yes, on, on interest rates, on cost of fuel yeah. and various Precisely. variables. Like that. Yeah. And uh, that, that is the second opportunity I didn't show is that if there ever was a time in history where you would want to log in long-term investments below cost, now is the time. Yeah. Because these margin basement cost curves are made on at a time where interest rates were more by four or five percent or six percent. Um, now they are you can you can borrow long term in your house at zero cost or very low costs. So right now, if you can if you get through any relations in investments right now, you can log it in at financing costs that are going to be low, very low in historical perspective. Understood. Um, do we have any other questions? Thank you for the questions we have had. Any, any other questions for Sagu? Okay. In that case, thank you so much, Sagu. I think we're going to be uh, asking you back to cover some of these other topics that you, you've hinted at there um, on, on a future event. But for now, thank you so much for your presentation today. I'd like to move on now to the, to the final uh, presentation of the day. And I think whatever the, the policy outcomes that we get um, from um, from Brussels or from, from wherever else, whatever the market initiatives that we've developed, the regulatory pressures, they're going to be implemented in the real world. And they're going to be implemented in particular by banks and other mortgage lenders. Now, that involves huge changes in the way that data is gathered, in the way that risks are modeled, in the way that stresses are understood. And that all has to be done in the context of real ongoing banking businesses trying to make a profit, trying to do their day-to-day -day job. And that's an area that uh, specialist management consultancy, the reply group, focuses on. So I'd like to ask uh, Chris Rossi, Sebastian Jert, and Louis de Mista of reply group. Um, guys, could you talk a little bit about how climate risks are built into banks? Uh, before you do that, though, Chris, could you just explain? Maybe people don't know reply group. Could you briefly just introduce, introduce your group to us? Uh, yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Richard. Um, my colleague, um, uh, Louis, who's uh, also here on the front page, will, will give that introduction. So Louis will start for us. And, and hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll quickly uh, go to that. Uh, if you could, go, can go to the next slide. Uh, I'll introduce first maybe myself and then um, and Sebastian and uh, Chris. Um, so we're part of the Reply Group. The Reply Group is a technology-focused group with more than 9,000 consultants. And if you go to the next slide, uh, Avantage is one of the companies that are part of the Reply Group. We're organized as a network, and we are specialized in the regulatory aspects. So we're focusing on a lot of regulation for banks as financial institutions, um, just like, for example, Basel IV. It's one of our uh, subjects that uh, we're covering, and we're covering those aspects from a strategic, from a business, from an IT change point of view. And so uh, in that context, we're starting to see that uh, a lot of our clients are uh, asking us to help them on some uh, ESG topics. Um, you see the green uh, dots are uh, the offices that are collaborating with each other uh, right now on those kind of initiatives. Uh, in Brussels, I am in charge of leading that initiative. Um, but we, where I work with Sebastian, Sebastian will present you a couple of things that um, our clients are asking us to do so that you see the white and the breadth of it. Um, on top of that, well, we have, we're collaborating with people from London, from Italy. And so Chris is, um, the guy that will uh, walk you through uh, the subject of today. Uh, he's one of the guys in charge of uh, ESG in uh, Italy, and he will walk through the modeling and the impact of stress testing this uh, on your, uh, your loans. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'll go very quickly to see 
what clients, what are typical clients are today. Uh, we, of course, have a lot of uh, requests from the risk management uh, departments of our, our banks. We also see that there's really an impact in the capital market uh, world. We have requests in helping uh, setting up green bonds, stuff like that. On the wealth management is the first one where we see really that it's driven by the customers. So more even than uh, on the mortgage side, customers on the wealth management side are wanting to invest in sustainable uh, products. And that also drives the demand uh, on, in the capital markets. And we also see, uh, of course, the reporting with the taxonomy uh, is one of the main drivers. And so uh, I have here uh, a couple of initiatives that are mentioned but uh, I will uh, let uh, Sebastian walk you through that. Uh, Sebastian, if you don't mind. Yes, uh, thank, you. thank you, Louis. So next slide, please. So here yeah, is the first case study. It's uh, concerning the EEM data uh, to integrate into the credit process. So correctly collecting new data, it's a major point of focus to properly enable the bank to reap the benefits of energy efficient mortgage. And so to participate in the EEM initiative, the bank will need to consider at least 10 new data points that are being collected. Uh, additional data will allow the banks to estimate the economic availability of the customer and revisit fair value of the real estate over time. So the data has varying level of granulatory, uh, ranging from the real estate property level to the contact customer level for fiscal data. And finally, the bank may want to consider collecting this data also for existing mortgage that participate in the sustainable renovation, such as the super bonus 110 in Italia. That's the first case study. If you pass to the next slide, you can show the. So, yeah, our second case study. So, it's an automated tool for SME. So we are exploring the development of a tool surrounding grid lending alongside with several banks. So the identification for a solution to automate through artificial intelligence and improve the data gathering collection related to the ESG performance of SMEs. So the improvement of this process at the moment, heavy and time consuming, will positively impact their banks for the rating screening process their internal external reporting to their commercial activities. Uh, last case study to the next slide, please. Yeah, so yeah, so the physical risk and so focus on the flood risk. So here, an analysis of credit risk factor arising from environmental factors. So uh, in this case, the first point is to identify the risk. In this case, the flood may have a physical risk and a loss of attractiveness region of Brussels. The second point is a qualification of the risk. The key factor is the geographical location, particularly in the credit exposure are locate, located in an identified vulnerable area. Exposure to physical risk due to impact on the valuation, so ex ante and the resulting damage exposed. A third, portfolio sensitivity to be assessed through scenario analysis. It must be included uh, in a credit risk model. And finally, uh, mitigating risk, in particular, ensure appropriate insurance coverage. Flood risk may be uh, diversified uh, to some extent due to the typical, typically local nature of this phenomenon. So it's a true example of case study. And if you go to the next slide, so we are also uh, being written on the use of quantitative tools to assess climate risk. And so this paper will be available on our website soon. So Chris, I let you expose uh, our main subject. Yep, thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Louis. So Richard, if you can go forward, uh, Lusanne, can, if you can go forward. Um, I'm, I'm not on mute, am I? Okay, perfect. So, um, Let's just take uh, five seconds to bask in all the topics we could discuss today. Uh, you know, there are literally hundreds of uh, different topics that we could discuss when we speak of uh, climate change or ESG and where they intersect with the economy and financial, and financial services. Um, and this is really a reflection of how important and impactful these uh, issues truly are. So when we talk about going into one topic, I think we should, you know, uh, obviously have um, 
maybe a, a day or two in our sleeping bags, uh, uh, you know, and, and the proper time to, to talk about it all together. I'm sh everybody is pretty well versed in these topics, at least a, a handful, and knows that um, you, could, you could literally uh, talk and discuss for days. Um, if you could go forward just for a second, uh, thank you. Um, but more in keeping with the objective of the Bauhaus, so brainstorming, um, we're going to talk about credit institutions and more specifically about uh, measuring climate risk. Credit institutions are obviously getting squeezed from all directions at the moment. Market demand for sustainable products uh, and effective branding is increasing every day. Supervisors are racing to catch up to the market. Uh, with a good example being the ECB's expectations, which you can see here on the right, uh, which regard climate-related and environmental risks. Uh, you all probably know um, this in some form. The ECB has basically put into writing that institutions need to consider these risks from all angles. So note here that you can see here on the bottom right, number 11, that uh, scenario testing and stress testing capability is one of the expectations. And we'll talk a bit about that, as we said uh, later, from a high-level perspective. Uh, and finally, the CRD and CRR in Europe will definitely evolve again. Many anticipate uh, preferential or even uh, punitive prudential regulation in accordance with the ESA's mandates, the ongoing mandates. Uh, and the previous speaker uh, duly noted uh, policy updates for Basel IV uh, as a good example. Uh, so uh, a lot to um, a lot to see here, and, and let's I guess we all stay tuned. Uh, next slide, please. The credit life cycle uh, is certainly impacted, and not just for uh, energy efficient mortgages. Uh, to help stimulate the economy, as we know, institutions are expected to work with all asset classes, uh, and this uh, this is particularly important in a uh, green deal European Green Deal landscape. Uh, the Energy Efficient Mortgages Initiative, for example, opens a great and well-needed debate about how uh, the offering design within a credit institution is impacted by fiscal stimuli, such as the super bonus, as we know in Italy. Um, Luca is an expert at the super bonus. We talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Along the lines of sustainable lending um, and to help stimulate the sustainable economy, institutions see new opportunities and dynamic pricing uh, maybe increased risks for inefficient mortgages on the books as well. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, we all know that data is key to anything that institu institutions do. That's highlighted by Sebastian and Louis in our introduction. Uh, data is uh, the underlying uh, uh, number one factor when we're talking about determining whether uh, a mortgage is, or real estate is efficient uh, just at its core. Monitoring, instead, is where a lot of fun stuff happens. Uh, it's obviously a generic term, monitoring, but uh, this is where um, we expect uh, tasks like transition risk, monitoring, risk measurement, and certainly internal reporting to be managed. Uh, and this is not just obviously our expectation, but this is more of an expectation that's highlighted again in the EBA um, uh, SREP paper and also in the ECB expectations. So if we can please just move forward one uh, on the next slide. There are, um, let's say, uh, certainly some leaders, some institutional leaders at the, in the market at the moment, but most uh, institutions are probably thinking what, uh, what, what most of us are thinking is, where do I begin to measure these risks? And I guess that's the first step when we're talking about measuring climate risk. Uh, here, uh, first of all, to simplify a bit the discussion and to save some time, uh, we, we unfortunately will not go over approaches to governance, organization, and, and, and organizational risk management, let's say. Um, so uh, step one seems a bit obvious, but you need to think about where you are exposed. Uh, I think everyone here is, again, well informed on uh, the concept of physical risk. Uh, we we I heard the speakers in the beginning talk um, very uh, passionately about um, the mortgages themselves, how they're how they're um, built and where they are, where they're located, um, and whatnot. And I've been seeing some of the past presentations. It's it's clear that um, the, uh, the the physical risk, not just obviously the mortgages, but also infrastructure, is highly important. And actually, that's where, as we uh, most of us know, transition risks come in, uh, meaning risk derived from changes in the economy to meet climate change benchmarks, and therefore, ironically, uh, to prevent physical risks. 
So you can ex exclude at the moment, if you wish, uh, if you are an institution, an entire sector, let's say oil and gas exploration uh, uh, sector or what it may be, to hedge uh, your risks, to mitigate your risks, let's say cut them off at the source. But maybe you also miss major opportunities to work with customers, clients, uh, that them, they themselves are making uh, uh, transitions to um, to mitigate um, the, the 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 current uh, landscape, and um, will obviously positively impact their sector and possibly also positively impact your uh, balance sheet. Capture these risks essentially means collecting usable data, and of course, putting that data to work is probably even more important. Uh, we are seeing that trusted external providers is absolutely key, but much more important is the ability of the institution to collect the data directly from the customer and perform due diligence. Uh, and we should all remember, uh, especially those who work with credit institutions, that uh, this is directly referenced in the updated EBA loan origination monitoring guidelines from 2020. There's a high focus on due diligence, uh, of uh, customer loans. Advanced modeling uh, has sort of a scary sound, but uh, can be embraced as an asset here. Uh, ideally, climate risk should be worked into strategy, allow financial impact considerations in multiple scenarios, help to find a way forward on transition paths, as, as we could call them. And of course, uh, imagine variance, uh, changes in the probability of default and loss given default of, uh, of uh, facilities or the, or the counterparty itself. Um, and so it, it's I, just a call out here, we put at the bottom, uh, I think highlights basically all you need to know. Information derived from these exercises, I'll just read literally, should feed back into the business strategy, pricing, stress testing, and eventually into capital impact analysis. I think this is probably a no brainer, but it's uh, a bit harder than, than it sounds for sure. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So, um, keeping in uh, mind uh, the the idea that uh, we learn our, uh, maybe best from what's happening in uh, at the moment in the market and between uh, um, different institutions, uh, let's look at some inter industry practices at the moment. Uh, here, we tried to represent from left to right uh, five categories based on our experience and conversations with institutions. Um, the first is pretty self-explanatory, a do nothing approach, um, which is maybe not wrong for some institutions. Uh, if the risks, uh, even without performing a comprehensive assessment are perceived as contained, uh, then waiting for best practices to be established may have its benefits. Uh, there is of course the risk of doing nothing, uh, meaning being unprepared and all of a sudden being on, uh, bombarded by uh, the supervisors or new regulation or the market itself. Uh, in fact, um, an initial assessment would be a recommended baseline. This would be the second category here, especially since the ECB self-assessment, self as we described before, for climate-related and environmental expectations is ongoing. And uh, we will see that supervisory review process, the SREP, will be updated soon with EBA recommendations on, e on uh, ESG. So uh, it, let's say an assessment is probably a baseline at the moment. Uh, logically, going forward, a scenario analysis is a bit more complex. And we observe an increasing number of institutions taking this on. Uh, mostly in the UK, as a matter of fact, because the uh, biannual exploratory scenario gives a 30-year time horizon and um, is also required by the Bank of England uh, for UK banks and also sub subsidiaries of European banks that are uh, in the UK. So just think about that for a second. Obviously, 30-year uh, time horizon brings us all the way to 2050, when in Europe, in theory, um, we will be at a net zero with respect to uh, industrial levels of carbon emissions. Under the ECB, uh, there, uh, there were 13 large uh, globally systemic uh, banks that participated in voluntary stress testing uh, between 2019 and 2020, uh, but the time horizon was obviously much shorter. And the, um, the stress that, let's say, the, the parameters that were used were a bit more flexible and a bit more sectorial. Uh, 
most let's let's say the most important thing moving forward however is that uh, most ecb uh, supervised institutions will need to perform stress tests on uh, climate risk climate change uh, with parameters to be determined still in 2022. Uh, the ecb set this out on their uh, website and made a, a communication about this uh, um, at the end of last year a VAR-like approach is not very common uh, from our vantage point at the moment, especially in credit institutions. So one institution that uh, already has an advanced VAR approach in place for modeling stress testing is working to integrate transition risk uh, to performance in, in, to inform its investment decisions. Uh, it seems like a logical choice for them. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, this one here on the right, speaking of integrated, uh, this last example of integrated analysis is also a good case uh, example of a viable solution with the proper preparation. And in fact, that's on the next slide. If you could go forward, please. So this uh, integrated assessment model, uh, IAM as, uh, as it's uh, known, was developed by our collaborator, uh, the Quant Foundry of London, with the Imperial College of London, uh, who published a research paper together uh, to detail the logic for peer review. So it's tried and true. Um, the IAM uh, here was used to help inform the Bank of England on how corporates will be impacted by transition risk, therefore helping uh, them to inform policy, again, uh, the key word here, policy, because as we all know, corporates uh, highly impact the economy and obviously the GDP. So uh, if corporates suffer, I don't want to be a proponent of trickle-down economics because I'm not really, but if corporates suffer, the economy suffers and uh, we, mostly we all suffer. So um, I just want to run you through the steps uh, here of this model and how it works at a high level again um, and how it can be used by institutions. Uh, please uh, obviously reach out to us or to Quant and together with Quant Foundry uh, for more information because uh, again, we could, we could speak for quite a few um, hours about this. So first step would be establishing greenhouse gas scenarios namely representative concentration pathways. And, and you are very uh, in, um, informed on, on the, again, the policy debate. Uh, this is obviously a starting point because uh, when we're talking about calibrating uh, the model, uh, if, for example, the EU, the UK, or uh, other governments decide that uh, concentration of greenhouse gases needs to be refined, needs to be changed, uh, in terms of policy framework beyond the current targets, well, this obviously will clearly impact the economy and certain companies uh, that are obviously on, on the other on the other side of the coin, customers of uh, credit institutions, and these customers therefore may become more or less risky. Uh, we all know, and it's been written many times, there will be winners and losers uh, in uh, in business in the economy. Uh, by these um, these reductions in greenhouse gases. So um, again, we're not talking about just risk, we're also talking about opportunity the other side. The model itself uh, is built by limiting the total number of greenhouse gas emissions based on uh, climate pathways. So the model projects changes in the economy and climate variables, which feed into simulations on, of uh, various sectors, regions, energy usage, energy prices, carbon taxing, um, and technology mixes, uh, you know, all of this can be done obviously at a sectorial level, uh, which is uh, which is helpful. But a particular strong point of this model is actually that it's done by this at the single counterparty level. So uh, the, the 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 single company that uh, is part of your um, part of your uh, uh, lending portfolio that maybe um, uh, has the highest amount of risk or will present the, the best opportunities for you to continue to do business with this type of count counterparty. And that again uh, is why, and we said it uh, a dozen times at least, data quality uh, is a, a major focus. Uh, data, uh, data quality obviously is worked into any, any, uh, any aspect when you're talking about applying information. It has to be uh, ensured that the data is correct. And this goes all the way back again to uh, you know, the, the, the proper framework and due diligence and making sure you're acquiring the proper information from your customer. Risk factor modeling essentially means number three, essentially means that we uh, translate the results of the model into useful information, uh, such as changes in equity price, changes in credit spreads and changes in default probabilities. Uh, so here we're uh, uh, turning the information on its head and we're actually deriving decision making, which goes into the scoring. Uh, if you so wish to go, let's say so far as to actually assign a score to the counterparty, 
that's that's obviously nice, but um, probably the, 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 the best type of score one can derive from this is capital impact in the near or long term. How will the uh, changes in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, limits, uh, taxes, et cetera, uh, impact uh, the, um, the the amount of capital I have on hand, and this can also obviously be used to inform, therefore, stress testing and and so on. So um, I, I would just uh, leave you with the next slide. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time. Obviously, I don't want to go over either. Uh, here we have a few more cases, and just a short example of what we have seen and and how we were involved. Um, uh, I would just quickly note on, on the last one on the right, uh, with reference to the ECB expectations, um, the, 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 the institution and uh, by, 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 um, by uh, obviously by playing the same, um, um, how can I say, uh, playing to their needs, well, obviously what they need, but also what's important, uh, placed a high focus on uh, internal governance, uh, which we briefly mentioned. Internal governance in the pop organization is highly important when we speak of climate risk. I don't think it should be um, at all looked over. So I would just go to the last slide uh, to um, to recap. Uh, hopefully, um, on, on one side we can we can uh, simplify the whole discussion uh, as complex again as it is. Uh, but just some takeaways. Uh, risk taxonomy again. Uh, again, I think everybody speaks about taxonomy. Um, should climate change be a discrete risk in the taxonomy or a meta risk uh, that cuts across risk types? Uh, from our experience and from whatever, from uh, speaking uh, with um, as many informed people as possible, there is no right answer at the moment. The institution needs to make the decision, and this also will depend for them, at least, on how they're currently organized. A business model analysis, uh, number two, uh, should be considered, including vulnerability and sustainability analysis. This is also highlighted by the ECB and the EBA. So how does climate change affect budgeting, planning assumptions, and so on? Metrics and reporting. Uh, measuring is good, but also sharing within the organization is important to make good and informed decisions. Obviously, we need these type of uh, information to uh, trickle up and trickle down all the way to the management body and uh, everywhere where it needs to be, um, need to be seen. Scenario analysis, uh, there are no historical precedents, obviously, for climate change, as we know, at least not in the um, Anthropocene epoch, but um, developing appropriate scenarios is the only real option here if we're talking about looking forward. Internal audit uh, may be a bit funny, number five, but um, for those of you who are involved with these types of complex uh, models and analysis, uh, know that decision making uh, here needs to pass independent review. So um, this is also an opportunity, let's say, for good preparation with the supervisory reviews that will become, if uh, will be oncoming if you uh, if if you do choose to perform some sort of uh, advanced analysis. And lastly, and certainly not least, implementation planning: uh, how to perform, how to develop plans, uh, and how to implement climate change-related initiatives across uh, risk management framework. Um, here, here we didn't name it specifically, but I would uh, just say really fast the, the, the phrase enterprise risk management. Um, we skipped over our considerations on the viability of, of uh, such a framework, but uh, this could be a starting point for many firms that already employ an enterprise risk management framework. So um, going beyond uh, ICAP, how can climate change be incorporated into a bank strategy? And these plans, are they funded and are they ex executable? Are they realistic, let's say? And can they withstand internal and supervisory scrutiny? All of this needs to be determined and uh, the clock is ticking. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I would just wanted to say uh, uh, really fast, thank you, Richard, and thank you um, to Luca for, for having us and Maria also for, for all, the, all the groundwork in Lucerne. Um, and uh, thank you to uh, Louis and Sebastian for the good introduction. And uh, in uh, here, special thanks to our colleague Hadrian uh, Van der in, in the UK, who uh, is an expert here on stress testing, and, and Dr. Cormac from the Quant Foundry, who uh, are collaborators we mentioned before on the IAM. Um, Richard. Thank, thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you, Chris. Sebastian and Louis, also for that. Um, clock is ticking in more ways than one, unfortunately. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but. I, I do want to ask one one question. What, what what you describe here 
is a very sophisticated, clever model, clever approach to all of these issues. And I know that um, the SREP process, and that's a bit arcane that, that area, but I know it's a very sophisticated and complex thing, but it's only as good as the data you're relying on. And a very quick anecdote that I remember meeting with a municipality who was borrowing a lot of money from a, um, a lender that I was working on a project with. And this guy was mad about the reporting requirements. The environmental impact reporting requirements were very frustrating. And he said, I have so many people that I have to report to. I have so much data on so many environmental variables. Um, it was very clear from his attitude the data integrity wasn't going to be great. And you mentioned due diligence in there quite a bit. How do you ensure that the data coming into these models is good. I know that's not a straightforward thing, particularly, I guess, in the current environment. COVID means it's impossible to go and check things a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true, Richard. Unfortunately, that's a major issue everywhere you look. Um, I don't want to, um, I don't want to go too off topic, but I think it's important to note that uh, in Europe, for example, the uh, principles for uh, risk and data aggregation. Uh, a little bit like a GDP, a GDPR, you know, gave an opportunity for us all to reflect on uh, how we're performing the business, what we're doing, and if we're doing it uh, up to standard. Uh, I mean, um, the um, the risk in data aggregation, which is slowly being extended beyond just risk data, but also into wealth management data, um, uh, um, uh, anti-money laundering data. Um, and you know, even even into market data at the moment, but a little bit less so because there's a high dependence on external sources. Uh, I think should provide a groundwork when we're talking about uh, the, these topics. So if if somebody were to ask me, uh, I you know I need to acquire new information maybe from an external source, or I need to collect new information from my credit uh, process. Uh, should I integrate it into my uh, risk and data aggregation uh, pr principle framework methodology, however you want to call it, I would say absolutely yes. But at the same time, there's also to be recognized that it's sometimes slow and it takes time to, to, to uh, put that online and it's uh, quite cost effective, uh, quite um, cost consuming. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, I don't want to say that you know having a good budget for these type of things is is the is the solution, but um, from my experience, the the whoever has had the, the proper planning and, and the and the right amount of money to spend on it has has been the the the, the leader you know in, in data quality. Yeah, so if I can just add on that uh, because the question is indeed a very good one. Um, we see that uh, actually it's uh, the the key to everything. Um, we see that a data initiative is where we are going to spend most of our time because it's uh, also maybe less sexy uh, than uh, what the internal people want to do. Um, and I also want to add that what we've seen is that we also have the inverse approach and that now risk departments are seeing, checking their methodology and seeing, okay, can we do it based on existing data, trying to you know, make use only of existing data instead of uh, adding new elements. Uh, with Anacredit and stuff like that, we see that there's been a lot of new data that has been um, used and that is reported. With IREF, there's also something coming to that. And so people want to limit that and to see whether they can mutualize and harmonize the data before using it. So, um, yeah, it's a trade-off to be done by everyone separately. Understood. Thank, thank you for that, Louis. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Sebastian. And thank you to everybody. I'm very conscious that we have to finish by three, so I, I am going to have to wrap it up. But thank you to all of the presentations today. Very diverse, fascinate, all fascinating. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And any feedback, please get back to Luca or Lucinia or Jenny or myself with any comments, anything else you'd like to hear about. And I'm going to hand it back to Luca for any wrap up comments. Thank you, you, Richard, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, I hope that we gave you a good uh, food for thought. I thought uh, that you could, will go back home with uh, some ideas uh, on how to improve your business and how to solve one problem. We, we are not highlighting challenges, but we are giving you opportunities that we can fix all together. So that, that's the purpose of this, uh, uh, of this Bauhaus. Uh, the next Bauhaus meeting will take place 
on Monday, the 29th of March. We already have a few ideas in the pipeline, but if you want to raise your ideas, if you want to share with us your ideas, please contact me, Richard, or my team, and we are more than happy to offer you a slot. And we are very much looking forward to seeing all of you in one month time, where we can have a new overview on a new brilliant ideas that, that can improve this market. Thank you all, and especially a big thank you to you, Richard, for guiding us in this kind of afternoon. Thank you very much, um, everyone, and uh, see you in one month time. Thank you. Thank you. See you next month. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.